Hi, hello everybody. Um, I hope you are well. Um, this is Omar just speaking. Um, I'm one of the partners of the labor and employment team at uh, Cuatro Casas. Um, and I'm here with my colleague Lara Vivas, um, who will also uh, join me on this webinar. So, as you probably know, well, we both have been um, uh, advising our clients on this very difficult um, situation. And first of all, I mean, first of all, allow us um, to say on behalf of the whole team that I hope not only you, but also your families and your team members are are, um, are all well, um, despite the difficult times that we're facing at the moment um, on a global basis. So thank you very much for joining and thank you very much for taking the time to be with us um, this afternoon. Um, uh, the, the, the idea for us would be to explain you relatively briefly what are the employment, the labor and employment measures that uh, your companies, your organizations can take um, in order to save some costs, um, particularly in terms of um, salary and social security costs and uh, are, are uh, as a consequence of the, uh, the, the force major derived from the state of emergency that is currently happening in Spain. And um, uh, we understand that this is a very similar situation that happened first in China at the very beginning of the crisis and then it went to Italy and is now um, in Spain as well as in um, other parts of Europe um, and also the, the US. So the idea, as I was saying, would be simply to try to explain to you in a very brief and basic way the uh, different measures that uh, a company can take in Spain in order to adapt um, and be a little bit more flexible in terms of the workforce uh, based on the decrease on the uh, demands, uh, the business-related reasons and the force major that is associated with the state of emergency. The webinar um, is aimed so is aimed to uh, be structured in three different parts. First of all, um, I will make a little bit of an introduction about the um, state of alarm or the state of emergency in Spain and the different measures that have been provided by the Spanish government. Um, then my partner Lara Vivas will discuss particularly the most significant um, uh, employment measure that is the what we call a collective suspension of contracts of employment. Uh, that you can consider that this is a collective lay layoff process um, and then Lara will discuss the two essential uh, uh, ways or the two essential alternatives to potentially suspend the contracts of employment. Alternative number one will be uh, to try to apply for what we call uh, temporary suspension of employment contracts based on force major um, and then there will be a second alternative also to be discussed which is a potential suspension of the contracts of employment based on a business related reason that might or might not be directly or indirectly related to the um, state of emergency approved by the government. And then I will uh, come back again to the discussion and I will highlight an additional what we call sort of soft measures uh, that can be discussed and that can be considered by the companies if they do not want to enter into uh, an application process to be filed before the Spanish government um, in order to suspend the contracts of employment. So we will briefly discuss issues such as uh, the, uh, how to make an effective use of PTO or vacation time and how to make a, a credit of hours so that they can be used more effectively later on in the year, um, paid or unpaid leaves um, and additional alternatives that we can um, structure based on the um, situation that we're facing at the moment. Um, so, uh, Lara, you want to um, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thank you, Juan. So this is Lara Viva speaking. Um, one more thing, if you have questions or if you want to send us a note uh, during this webinar, you can send us a note uh, at webinar uh, at cuatrecasas.com. Uh, we'll try to sort out the questions that you may have during, during this brief moment that we're going to be sharing. But in any case, you can send your questions there on the web on the on the address that you're seeing on the presentation so as as juan was saying um he will go on with the a little bit of the framework on the declaration of the state of alarm that is currently in force in spain thank you very much lara 
So, uh, what has happened? Uh, as in other countries, um, and we have to date back to the 14th of March, uh, when the Spanish government um, declared the state of emergency. We call it in Spanish language the state of alarm, uh, but it is more kind of linked to uh, the state of emergency that has also been declared in the US or in other uh, places in continental Europe. So, the 14th of March, the Spanish government uh, declared this a state of emergency that have some implications and consequences. Particularly in the first place, there are some activities that are on forced closure um, as a consequence of the state of emergency. That means that there are also other activities that are still allowed, and then we'll come back to this a little bit later. And then there's a third point, which is the restrictions on free movement, um, which is more limited to individuals, uh, but it may also affect uh, businesses, particularly to the extent that businesses cannot operate if people cannot freely move, right? So, um, first place, what are the activities uh, that are under closure, under what we call under forced closure now? Um, so it's essentially, uh, as the PowerPoint presentation says, retail establishments and, and premises. So essentially all commercial activity has been on forced um, closure. Um, there is only one exception, which is of course supermarkets, and there is also another uh, another exception, which is um, all these what we call essential services. And we'll come to that later on when we discuss the activities that are still allowed. So generally speaking, all retail establishments, all retail shops are closed, effective from the 14th of March. Um, all restaurants, catering sectors, anything related to um, uh, the provision of food, um, except for food delivery, which is still allowed, interestingly speaking, but all the restaurants and caterings are also closed, cafes, uh, small shops, and so on and so forth. And then all the tourism, uh, particularly hotels and, and accommodations, establishments, they are also in forced closure. The deadline for the forced closure is March 26. The difference between hotels and any other commercial activities is because, of course, hotels could have had guests in their own uh, establishments, in their own locations, and they needed some time to vacate them and to send them back home. So, uh, generally speaking, all uh, retail establishments or restaurants and catering sections, all hotels, all commercial activities are on forced closure. What does it mean? Well, it means that the employees that are devoted to these activities will not uh, be able to work. Um, and that's why the second part of the presentation will be focused on what we can do with these employees. Um, there's also, I mean, the, the fact that there are some activities that are on forced closure means that there are other activities that are still allowed. And particularly, and this might change within the following week as it has changed in Italy, it is very uh, important to say that general industries, factories are still uh, open. And are still open to the extent that the health and safety provisions can still be adequate to uh, minimize the impact of any potential uh, COVID-19 infection, coronavirus infection. So as an example, any factory that can still be open in Spain needs to take out some health and safety measures, particularly in terms of they need to warranty that all the employees will not uh, contact each other and they will have at least separated in between one meter and one meter and a half from one to each other. So that means that there are certain factories that can still operate because they are not labor intensive in terms of employees, uh, but there, will, there are other factories that cannot really operate because they are really intensive and they cannot uh, operate without fulfilling these uh, health and safety measures. Uh, but the industry is still closed. This might change later on in the week uh, as it happens in other countries, particularly in Italy. Uh, a final element in terms of the activities that are still allowed, it is important to know that there are some activities that are really essential um, for, the, uh, for the crisis, and that is particularly energy, and that are considered to be critical infrastructures and have special features, of course, because they, they need to operate and they need to warranty continuation of the business, even if there are some infected employees in the workplace and they have to have some contingency plans in place, uh, essentially devoted to 
continue the work and continue the provision of the energy. And that also applies to essential services such as um, provision of food for supermarkets or even uh, providing for some technology or uh, communications um, uh, because we're all teleworking at the moment or most of us are working teleworking at the moment. It is also important not to keep us isolated to that developing stage. Right. Restrictions on free movement, uh, as you say in the presentation, they are limited to individuals, but they may affect. They affect particularly transportation companies. Airlines, of course, are subject to a lot of restrictions to operate globally. Uh, hotels are also subject to a lot of restrictions, particularly to the extent that most of their populations, most of their guests, are international, are international uh, and, and and overseas uh, guests. And they also they have a limited activity based on the fact that people cannot freely travel in and out of the country. So um, this is essentially the, 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 the general framework uh, of the state of emergency, of the state of alarm, which has made us uh, with a situation whereby there's a significant number of employees in Spain that they do not have work at the moment. And then we have a significant number of employees who, even though they still have work, the companies have to implement some sort of health and safety measures in order to prevent an infection in the workplace. Um, and I will um, leave to Lara to discuss particularly what to do, particularly with those employees who do not have any work at the moment. Sure, thank you, Juan, for this introduction. Um, so what is going on with companies that really do not have work due to this full situation? Um, and let me introduce here what we call the temporary suspension of employment contracts or the temporary reduction of working time. They are both uh, structured in the same way. They need to be done through the same procedure. And what essentially happens is that the Spanish legislation allows companies to send employees on unemployment for a period of time that has to be temporary during these difficult um, these, these difficult times. Um, this is not peculiar to this COVID situation. It was enforced before. But as in every country these days, we are seeing changes in the particular procedure that needs to be followed to put in place this kind of, of measures. Um, basically, what has happened the last week is that um, the procedure was reduced in terms of uh, the duration, and it was also simplified in terms of how much documentation has to be delivered to the authorities. Just as, a, as an idea for you, there's over 10,000 companies that have already filed this. Um, and we have hundreds of thousands of employees currently going on to unemployment during the state of alarm and, and the special situation. So how, how do you go on with these temporary suspensions or temporary reductions of working time? Well, what it means is that basically employees can either reduce their working time and the reduced part will be on unemployment or they can be sent home on specific days uh, or weeks or months. Months, um, and they will be getting unemployment during that time. They can be funded on two different types of grounds. They can be uh, reasoned on false majeure uh, or on business related reasons. And here's the big difference between the, the first and the second. Um, the causes that the force majeure is going to be grounding the cases where, as Juan explained before, the activities have been limited or restricted directly by the government during the crisis. So this is a very clear situation where companies can say that they need to send employees on unemployment. And as you may imagine, if you're a retail store and the government tells you that you cannot operate during the state of alarm because everyone has to stay home, um, obviously you have no occupation for your employees during those days and consequently uh, these employees can be sent home and uh, be paid unemployment. So this is a, a, an easy way. Um, as we said, it would apply to suspension or a cancellation of activities, as Juan said. Obviously, uh, to the extent that the government prohibited all kind of big events, uh, concerts, um, uh, cultural activities, movies, and so on, all of those would also be linked to the force majeure. Uh, obviously, also, uh, things that would directly um, 
derive from the restriction of mobility of the employees. Those would also uh, be arguably uh, force majeure. Um, and, and very clearly also the lack of supplies that seriously impede the continued development of the activity. So if it becomes impossible for a company to continue rendering services because there's no supplies reaching Spain um, or the plant, um, that would be a reason for force majeure. And in this, in this relation, please remember that Europe has closed borders, um, not, for, uh, not for merchandising, but for people and for certain um, uh, uh, traveling. So this can be also a reason for the force majeure. And finally, also uh, for urgent and extraordinary situations where you've seen, where we've seen uh, employees that got that got infected, and therefore there's no possibility to uh, continue working due to the sick leave of a relevant number of employees, or just because it's not possible to continue with the health, the health and safety measures in place in the companies. Um, beyond those, which are very clearly those related by by the government, those prohibited by the government, we would be able to argue. Um, the direct decrease of activity of a certain company due to the COVID-19. But as you may imagine, you know, the further we get from the directly prohibited activities, the more we need to argue um, that those need to be, to be related to the COVID. Um, what happens if we are not in one of those situations? Well, what happens is that we can still send people home because we might really not have an activity for our employees, but we could do it on business related reasons. Um, that means that if we have a loss in production, uh, so a relevant change in the demand of products or services that we are offering into the market, um, and these, and these uh, services are substantially reduced by the full crisis, we'll be able to still argue that we cannot have an occupation for employees and we'll be able to send these employees into unemployment. So what's the big difference between the two reasons? So the, the big difference between the two has to do with the procedure and with the grounds. And of course, as well, with, the, uh, with some benefits attached to the force majeure that are not applying into business related reasons. Um, in both cases, please let us please see that there that unemployment in Spain will be an amount that will be rather limited, and it will be of a maximum of between one thousand and one thousand four hundred uh, and one thousand four hundred euro per month, depending on the situation of each of the, of the employees. But it will not reach anything further, which, as you may imagine, it is a very substantial. It has a very substantial impact into the domestic um, act and the domestic uh, balance of, of, of each of the employee situation. So, what's the difference between the two uh, procedures? And uh, let me just go through it very quickly. The procedure for force majeure to request the suspension of employment starts with a request to the labor authority. Um, we need to simply file a request uh, with with a report that indicates the link between the activity and the COVID. Uh, 19. Um, it has to be communicated to the interested parties and to the works representatives if they exist. Um, uh, they then, the labor authority will then have five days to um, deliver whether they estimate that this is a force majeure case or not. And if there is a force majeure case, the effects of the unemployment will be retroactive from the date of the existence of the force majeure. Um, this is very relevant, as you see, there is no negotiation with the works representatives or the employees. So employees, if the labor authority decides that there is a force majeure, they will go straight into unemployment and for the full duration of the state of alarm. Um, the state of alarm was set first until the 29th of March, but it will be approved probably tomorrow that it will go on until the 12th of April. 
The procedure for business-related reasons is slightly different. Um, it as well starts with the communication to uh, the, in this case, to the works employees or the unions. Um, this is a change introduced last week. Um, so it has to start with a communication to the works representatives, employees, or the unions. Um, and then it will go on uh, by, it will follow with the delivery of uh, the documentation justifying the grounds. Um, those will be discussed for a maximum period of seven days with the unions or the works representatives for that specific negotiation. And that will end with either an agreement or, with, or without an agreement. Um, but in any case, the company at the end will need to communicate its decision on the uh, suspension. And then it will need to follow up with the public employment services for the unemployment um, payment. So as you may see, it is, uh, there is a need for negotiation, not necessarily a need for an agreement. And please note that because the force majeure will normally apply during the state of alarm only, the procedure for business related reasons will be compatible with the other procedure, especially for those activities that will not recover immediately upon the termination of the state of alarm. Um, because some activities, of course, will need a little bit longer to go back to normal. Um, this as far as the procedures, Juan, if you want to go on. Thank you very much, Lara. So I think that makes perfect sense. If I can just quickly summarize uh, for the for the attendees, uh, the procedure, I mean, the process for a collective suspension of contracts of employment is essentially a cost-saving exercise for the companies. So what the company can save, the company can save the salaries of the employees um, and the company can save also the social security contributions up to a certain limit as, as Lara was discussing. And it is certainly a cost saving exercise that will be extremely helpful and particularly which will also be ideal and consistent with other measures of uh, government funding that uh, you might have seen in different jurisdictions as well. So it's, it's a cost saving exercise and that's the reason why um, I would say that a large percentage of the companies in Spain are applying for these government funds um, under this collective suspension of employment contract. Uh, the, the decision lies on whether to go for a force major collective suspension or whether to go for a business related collective suspension. As Lara was indicating, the main difference is that the force major collective suspension does not require any negotiation. So it's a little bit kind of automatic, at least in, in, in the petition or filing process, whereby the business related reason requires some discussion and some period of consultation where the worst comes. So it is possible, but it is not a kind of uh, an extremely short term route. Um, because if you want to do a force uh, major filing, you can do it in two days or in three days. If you want a business related uh, collective suspension, you would need to negotiate and the process or the periods to negotiate in between the setting up of the uh, consultation body and the negotiation might be in the region of around two weeks. So force major, no negotiation, kind of an automatic filing process. Business related, it requires negotiation uh, with the works council and with the employees. Okay, so that's that's essentially what we wanted to discuss with you in terms of the uh, collective suspension of employment contracts or, 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 or as an alternative, we call them collective uh, lay, lay, layoffs. There are other alternatives. There are other soft alternatives as we call them. Uh, that some companies might decide to uh, to look at that. One, and we've received that number of questions from a number of our clients, is that it is possible, rather than to go for a collective suspension of employment contracts, is it possible to ask the employees to be on forced vacation? Um, the answer, technically speaking, is no. We cannot oblige the employees to take forced vacation, particularly when they cannot go out of their homes and they have to stay at home all the time. Um, but I understand that if uh, you only have a very limited number of individuals in Spain, you can approach them one to one and say, well, rather than for us to take you to the unemployment benefits, why don't you take, let's say, one week of vacation and then we'll see how the issue and how the situation progresses in the next few days. So forced vacation or forced CTO, it is not, technically speaking, an ideal option for a large population, but it can be 
uh, discuss individually with the employees if you don't have a very large population in Spain. Another alternative, which is uh, uh, the distribution of, of working time within a one year reference period. So in Spain, working time, uh, we have a maximum working time that applies for a one, one full year. So that's possible to um, negotiate and to discuss with the workforce in Spain that, okay, for the two, three, four weeks, everything will be closed. You will not be working, but we will get a credit of hours that the company can use and make good use after the state of emergency, after the state of alarm expires. So the idea would be to try to work on a kind of a credit hours for the employees that will be used later on in the year from now until December. Uh, there is, of course, paid leave and unpaid leaves. Paid leave um, can be implemented by the company, and, and some companies are still deciding to pay the salaries to the employees even if they are not working. Unpaid leaves, uh, it will have to be discussed individually with its employee because, of course, an unpaid leave, you know, for the employee to accept an unpaid leave, it's much more convenient for him or for her, and also for the company to go through the collective suspension of employment contracts, as Lara was discussing. And finally, there is, of course, the possibility to ask the employees to reduce their salaries because their activity um, is not as significant as it was um, in the past. Again, it's a, it's a decision that might be taken on an executive level, but it's not very much used to a non-employee level because, again, here, uh, companies would prefer to go for the collective suspension of employment contracts instead of a pure um, application of a reduction of salaries, which is possible, but it's much more uh, difficult to do on practical terms. So these are the soft measures that um, some companies are also um, considering. Uh, in addition to the collective uh, layout and layoff process that Lara has very well described uh, for you. Um, that's essentially uh, the information we wanted to, to touch base on you. Um, Juan, we have maybe a couple of minutes uh, uh, because we have our colleague Anna Campos from the Knowledge Department who is this is essential to us because they are gathering all the new regulations and putting in place everything to help us. And I think she has been gathering uh, questions if they if they were any. So maybe we have two minutes to see if we can go through a couple of questions. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Lara and Juan, for a, an exceptional exposition, in my opinion. And uh, we do have several questions posed by the assist by the attendees to this webinar. Um, uh, the first one uh, would be if employees who are affected by a temporary suspension of employment are entitled to a severance compensation from the company. Um, and uh, um, if it if it in if it in Spain it has been forbidden like it has in Italy to um, to it, it, it has been forbidden to carry out terminations during this period of crisis. Um, thirdly, the another question is uh, regarding registration uh, of working time. Uh, if uh, it's still on, if companies have to comply with it, although most of the the workforce is uh, teleworking. So these would be uh, three the three queries we have right now on the table. And I think we do have a couple of minutes to re answer them. I don't know which one would like to take up the, the gauntlet. Well, if I come in, this is Juan speaking. Thank you very much, Anna. If I can just get the first one. Um, if I understood correctly, the question is, if we implement a collective suspension or a collective layoff, so uh, we, we, we get the government um, funding, as we've discussed, if there is any need to pay any severance payment to the employees prior to the suspension? And the answer is no. The answer is no, because severance is only paid if there is a collective redundancy. So uh, we, we draw a distinction between what is a suspension of employment contracts and a termination plus a rehiring after the crisis has ended. So uh, the government funding is only available for those companies that are uh, suspending contracts of employment, but are not dismissing people or making redundancies, right? So there is no need to pay any severance. Employees can go automatically to the unemployment office once the, uh, the file 
filing or the petition for the uh, suspension of the contracts of employment contracts is accepted and the employees will not receive any severance and will then be rehired. The contract will be suspended and will get into full force and effect as soon as the situation uh, progresses um, in, in a better way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Juan, I'll take the second. second. Yeah, I'll take the second question. Uh, if I noted this correctly, the question is whether it's been prohibited in Spain to dismiss employees during the the period of uh, the state of alarm. Um, it has not been prohibited. So in Spain, you can still dismiss employees. Um, the only thing that is relevant here is that some of the benefits that have been put in place uh, last week, uh, such as the exemption of social security contributions during the temporary suspension of employment contracts due to force majeure, will require the companies to um, maintain employment during a period of six months after the reinstatement of the activity. So essentially it means that uh, if the company is benefiting from certain exceptional measures put in place for this COVID, um, there will be a need to maintain employment for a period of six months. So it's not a prohibition, but it's actually giving an economic impact to companies if they benefit from certain conditions and certain um, you know economic advantages and later on they they go on and dismiss employees so that's for the qu second question Juan do you want to take the the time registry question and then we can wrap up sure I will just give you my uh, my recommended answer to the third question which is if the registration of working time is still valid um, for those of you who are relatively new to Spain or to Spanish regulations, uh, there is an obligation to track working time effective in Spain from last year. So we have to track uh, the commencement date of each day of work and also the end date, uh, so the end timing. Uh, the, the obligation to register working time is still in place, even though with the state of emergency. But what we understand is that particularly the labor authorities and the labor inspectors would uh, be relatively flexible to that respect. Um, essentially speaking, because they will be dealing with all the collective uh, suspension processes that will be uh, requested by a number of companies. So our understanding is that they would really have no time, at least in the short term basis, to deal with the tracking of working time obligation. So is it still in place? The answer is yes. Uh, we understand that the uh, authorities will be a little bit more flexible in terms of compliance with this. And, and it is also important to know that any computer-based tracking system will work. So, for instance, we will be able to track the time at the beginning of each day and at the end of each day where the employees that are teleworking will uh, sort of dial in, uh, will sign up to or will sign in into, into the computer-based program of the company. So we understand that kind of this sign in and sign out on the computer will work as a good tracking of the working time while the employees are still sort of working. I don't know, Lara, if you if you have anything yeah. else to, to add on that final question. I fully agree with it. Um, so I think with that, uh, Juan, we can wrap up. Uh, I think what we wanted to share with you is a very a very short summary uh, in a nutshell what's going on in Spain. As we said, there has been a declaration of state of alarm. It's going to be in place uh, until the 29th and most likely at least until the 12th of uh, April. Uh, we, sp we told you the current situation of the limited activities and the measures that the company can take both the suspensions of working time and reductions of working time due to force majeure and uh, business related reasons and also these soft measures to put in place in companies that might have a little bit more flexibility. Um, we'll be following up on these webinars if there's relevant changes in the law or in the situation in Spain. So please stay tuned with us on LinkedIn and other in, in our webpage. If you have questions that we would that you would like to address to us, we have a special task force working on this. And you can send us an email on queries.covid19 at quadricasas.com, as you see on the on the uh, presentation right now and we'll follow up on those um, later on. 
we've reached the time and in fact we went on for a little bit longer we really want to thank you for attending this webinar and of course stay home and stay safe uh, same here on my side so thank you very much for um, attending for your interest um, and of course both Lara and I will be very very happy to um, answer any other additional question that, that you may have uh, moving forward so keep safe and thanks very much for your attention and your interest.